What would you think if we told you that a bone-dry desert can turn into a blooming paradise in a flash? If life suddenly sprouts where there was only barren rock and sand before, a miraculous caprice of nature, or the result of a revolutionary plan tied with catastrophic consequences for the entire world. Stay tuned and immerse yourself with us into the groundbreaking world of an overwhelming transformation like you've never seen before. The Desert State A brief look at the statistics reveals Saudi Arabia is one of the hottest and driest countries on Earth. The desert nation's annual precipitation is pegged at just about 2.3 inches, with the majority of the sparse rain falling between the months of December and February. For comparison, in Germany, the corresponding figure is about 27.6 inches. The view of the average temperature values is no less extreme. The thermometer in Saudi Arabia climbs to 122 degrees Fahrenheit in some places during the hot summer days, only to fall below freezing again at night. Geographically, the absolute monarchy is located on the extensive highland, which consists predominantly of a barren sand desert and regions of volcanic rock. Given these inhospitable conditions, it should surprise no one that the distribution of population in Saudi Arabia is very uneven. With only 2% of the country's area accounts for cities, around 6.5 million of the nearly 35 million inhabitants live in the capital Riyadh. In total, 85% of the population live in urban agglomerations. With an area of about 810 square miles, Germany could theoretically fit into Saudi Arabia six times over. With this knowledge in mind, the following circumstance appears all the more surprising. Despite its extreme landscapes, Saudi Arabia is by no means dependent on food supplies from abroad. On the contrary, the desert state even produces more food than it needs and therefore exports large quantities of grain, fruits, and dairy products to other countries. A Turbulent Cornerstone When we look at the corresponding aerial views, an inevitable question arises within us. How is this possible? How can a colossal patchwork of green spaces emerge in the middle of the desert? Well, to understand what's going on with the transformation of the Saudi Arabian desert, we have to turn back the clock a few decades. Back in 1973, the so-called Yom Kippur War ignited with the support of numerous other Arab states. Egypt and Syria unexpectedly attacked Israel. In the end, the Israelis who had the backing of the USA managed to repel the attack and push back the enemy troops. As is well known, the effects of a military conflict extend far beyond death and destruction on the battlefields. To put pressure on Israelis' western supporters, the Arab countries reduced their oil production, with the result that the oil price quadrupled for a time. At the same time, there was a growing concern in Saudi Arabia about the possible retaliation from the affected nations. Since the country was heavily dependent on food imports during the time of the oil price shock, a corresponding embargo would have massively impacted the population. And so it happened that the Saudi government adopted a plan to provide the nation with independence from food imports. Because one thing we should never forget, Saudi Arabia is rich in water. However, the precious liquid there doesn't present itself in the form of countless lakes and rivers but as a gigantic groundwater reserve. The Transformation of the Desert Once official permission was granted to agriculture to tap into those underground reserves in vast amounts, the groundwork for the transformation of the desert was laid. The unbelievable dimensions that the mega-projects assumed are demonstrated by a look at the artificial irrigation system in the Wadi Ashiran region. For a period of 25 years, a 386-square-mile agricultural area was created from scratch. For comparison, the area of Berlin is just about 344 square miles. Between 1980 and 1993 alone, the irrigated farmland in Saudi Arabia grew by more than 260%. In detail, the royal house mainly had wheat grown on the newly developed farmland. The result was that the desert state 
which had previously been almost exclusively associated with oil, became the sixth largest wheat exporter in the world. However, it is in the nature of things that the cultivation of desert fields is linked with some massive complications. Where the environment is dry and the climate harsh, the groundwater sometimes needs to be brought up from a depth of 0.62 miles. For subsequent water supply, the Saudis rely on mobile sprinkler systems, which operate automatically and have diameters of up to 1.86 miles. This is an enormous and extremely costly effort, which should consequently also be reflected in the market. While the world market price for a ton of wheat was around $120, the Saudi's production costs amounted to about $500. And even though the initial wheat boom then quickly collapsed, the original dream of independence initially seemed to have been fulfilled. After all, Saudi Arabia still sells large quantity of food abroad. For example, in 2019, the desert state produced more potatoes than Ireland. The price of the boom and yet, anyone who thinks through the idea of unrestrained groundwater extraction inevitably comes to one conclusion. This concept simply cannot work in the long term. Because as we all know, water, just like oil, is a resource that is not renewable. In fact, water that quenches the boundless thirst of Saudi agriculture has a long history. Since it's over 30,000 years old, it's also referred to as fossil water by experts. Of course, the sparse rainfall in the region is not sufficient to replenish the reserves after extraction. According to a report by the United Nations, the groundwater level in some parts of Saudi Arabia is dropping by up to 20 feet per year. A look into the future doesn't paint a rosy picture either. The reserves could be completely depleted in just a few decades. However, this is by no means a process that has only recently started. The first wells dried up as early as the 90s, which led the government to noticeably throttle back on grain cultivation. However, this decision had no major impact on total water consumption. Instead of grain, the focus shifted to the production of animal feed and vegetables, which even further increased the extraction of groundwater. Looking back, experts evaluate the Saudi attempt to defy natural conditions and reshape the desert for human processes as devastating. True to the motto, deserts simply do not bloom, the projects were mainly a massive waste of money and sensible resources. However, since the cultivation of the wasteland rang the state's cash registers for decades, the Saudi rulers resisted a change in thinking for a long time. Ultimately, it wasn't until 2008 that the government announced that it would gradually withdraw from wheat production and drastically cut back on the production of fodder. A decision that, in turn, has direct consequences for natural agriculture. While the Saudi dairy company Almirai was able to source the cattle feed from home in the past, the decline in state production leads to a particular development. Indeed, since then, the corporation has been buying up farmland in other countries, only to then export the products back to Saudi Arabia. However, in doing so, another vicious cycle is set in motion. Since the corresponding fodder plant, alfalfa, is one of the most water-intense plants of all, many foreign production facilities are then forced to tap into their groundwater reserves. The Green Desert Expansive lakes, babbling rivers, and even hippos indulging in lush green surroundings. All of these things we do not associate with the dusty desert of Saudi Arabia today. Therefore, the fact that the described scenery embodied reality many thousands of years ago is all the more astounding. Pioneering research reveals that the Saudi Nifod Desert was a blooming paradise 400,000 years ago, attracting many of our ancestors. The unique stone tools that experts discovered in the area not only represent the oldest evidence of humans on the Arabian Peninsula, but we are even dealing with the earliest evidence of modern humans. In summary, the researchers reconstructed that the desert landscape was once adorned by at least six extensive lakes. Thus, during the wet warm periods, the landscape resembled a quote, green Arabia. To determine the exact age of the discovered lake sediments, 
experts use a sophisticated method called luminescence dating. In this process, scientists analyze when the corresponding layers were last exposed to sunlight. While the oldest samples are over 400,000 years old, the youngest lake is likely to have disappeared only 55,000 years ago. What is particularly exciting is that from the different tool finds, researchers infer that the blooming desert was roamed not only by early Homo sapiens, but also by Neanderthals. Thus, the Arabian Peninsula must not only have become a scene of cross-species encounters at that time, no, experts also consider it possible that the various inhabitants even occasionally interbred. Specifically, scientists assume that about 1-4% to of our genetic makeup comes from the Neanderthal. However, the groundbreaking finds and insights collected in the tracks of the Green Desert are likely just the tiny tip of the archaeological iceberg. Only a decade ago, there was no known site on the vast Arabian Peninsula that was more than 10,000 years old. While we know that our ancestors arrived in Australia at least 50,000 years ago, when and how they managed to advance to Asia is still an unresolved mystery of the past. We look forward to learning what information researchers will gain in this regard in the future. As soon as there is something new on this exciting topic, we will inform you on our channel. But for now, we want to thank you for watching. Please feel free to leave us a free subscription and a thumbs up if you enjoyed our video. Finally, we're interested in your opinion. What do you think about the transformation of the Saudi deserts and the associated consequences? Did you know that the wasteland was once a green idol? And what historical truths might still be slumbering beneath the hot desert sand?